Well, it's time for voiceover body shop because we do it every week. And our guest this week is Townsend Coleman. <laughs> Say hi. Hello. He does his own sound effects. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is going to be an entertaining hour of fascinating talk with Townsend. We've got some tech talk later on, and we're going to talk about all the stuff that you're doing and all the stuff you've done, but we won't dwell on the past. And the future. We're, we're going to dwell on what's best for you guys out there. Coming up on VoiceOver Body Shop. Woohoo! From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions, and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, Remote Studio Connections for Everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. JMC Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive, from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are the guys. Hey there, I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. Yes. Well, we're back in the secret clubhouse here in Sherman Oaks <laughs> for another week of VoiceOver Body Shop. And, uh, you know, Southern California, it's either spring or it's summer. And suddenly it's summer again. And occasionally vibrating violently. Yeah, which is fun when things start to. It's fun after you've lived here long enough to appreciate what it could be and that have some perspective over what earthquakes really mean. I yeah. mean, I, at the longer I've been here, the more those little shakes become less inten intense and intimidating. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I've also learned not to run out of the building screaming. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> usually it's, you know, Jacob will come running out of his bedroom or something and say, what was that? Go, it was an earthquake. Is there going to be more? I, I want to tell my I friends. So. <laughs> We're doing a live web chat. They all want to know, but they want to see me shake on camera. Really? I'm waiting for one to happen while we're doing the show, but they happen so rarely. Yeah. I mean, constantly moving. You just check the pictures on your wall and you'll see, you know, California <laughs> seems to be constantly moving. Anyway, speaking of California, we have a guest tonight who is a California resident for a long time. And uh, he is a voice actor. On You've heard him on just about everything. That I haven't done, um, which is a whole lot. <laughs> anyway, let's bring into our studio and welcome on Voiceover Body Shop, Townsend Coleman. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> it's like, it's like stumble in gracefully, huh? Know, Whack my head on the microphone. <laughs> there we go. Well, hey, kids. All right. How are you? We're here. Uh, welcome. Thanks. Welcome thanks to for, our secret clubhouse. Yeah, thanks for having me over to the clubhouse. This is, uh, this is some fun. Yeah, we have fun here. Yeah, yeah. I especially love this guy right here. Oh, where is it? The, the, that, the, the big the, mic? That enormous mic right there. It's, yeah, don't whack your head on that it's one. It's for really big voices. <laughs> Not to yeah, scale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, well, once again, welcome. Thanks. Uh, now, you've had an excellent career. Now, you came out here in 1984 from where? From Cleveland. Cleveland? Yeah, where I grew up. You grew up in Cleveland. Yep. So I grew up just up the just up the lake. In Buffalo. Just up the lake, <laughs> right. Just up the coastline there. Right. Yeah. yeah, Buffalo. Oh, so then you know well what uh, lake effect snow is like. Oh, oh, oh I do. <laughs> and what we, oh, what, do. what we got to escape coming from the Midwest out here to Boy, sunny SoCal. This time of year, do we miss it? it no. Not no. all that. 
Yeah. yeah. But to my friends in Buffalo, I miss you. All right. Two or, two or three of them. Right, right. You know, you know. That you still remember. No, exactly. You know, <laughs> you know, great football team. If you didn't have two had. or three before, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> anyway, so what did you start in radio or what 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 were the factors that brought you out here low back those many years when the air here was brown and things right. were very different. Right, right. Well, uh yeah, I did start in radio and I uh, kind of got my start in radio because my dad had been in radio ah. uh, back in the mid 50s uh, when we lived in Denver. And my folks actually met uh, working at NBC in New York. Cool. Um, working at 30 Rock. And my dad was the um, manager of uh, uh, guest relations of their tour division. Oh. And so, so yeah, like he was running the pages and stuff. Right. Like he was that. the boss of the pages yeah. in New York. So, but his real goal was he wanted to be a network announcer. Um, he had some acting aspirations and some radio aspirations and, and, uh, but his big goal was he wanted to be, uh, an announcer for the network at NBC. And back in those days, you had to uh, go through a special program that they had, uh, and, and basically be approved to then be considered for an announcing job at the network. Well, he, he wasn't accepted into that program and, uh, dejected. He moved us from Manhattan when I was a year old to Denver. Mm. And uh, he got on uh, the radio out there and had a very short broadcasting career, but but long enough that he, in all his stories about it and talking about it and stuff growing up, I I really had sort of this sense that this was, I don't know, a cool business somehow. So, yeah, so when I was a kid and got my first little transistor radio in Cleveland, um, there was something magical about hearing the voices that I, and, and not being able to see these guys, but having a really strong sense of um, uh, uh, being attached to them somehow and, and curious what they looked like. What did this room that they were sitting in look like because it sounded so huge uh, in Cleveland, I could pick up WABC in New York at night of course. and I would listen to that. And of course they had more reverb <laughs> on, right. on that uh, right. station. Was this mostly AM at that? Uh, it was all AM. AM. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. CKLW stuff. out of Buffalo. Exactly. We got CWKBW out of Buffalo. Right. We got yeah. CKLW. Yeah. Uh, the Motor City. Uh, and you pick up more at night, right? Oh yeah. It was all at night. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fear yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they would exactly. boost the power to 50,000 watts at night. Right. Oh, they could boost it. Right. Yeah. And that was just magical to me. I mean, I remember lying in bed looking out my window at night and off in the distance there was a radio tower that i could see it had a red light you know flash of the beacon flashing on top yeah. and and i knew it was a radio tower and and but i didn't know which one and i just imagined that i was listening to the radio that it was coming out of that red light <laughs> at the top yeah. of that tower <laughs> and that somehow there was there was magic in that uh alchemy in that to me so, hmm. so that's really what kind of along you know with coming up with my dad's stories and stuff um that's really sort of what lit the the fuse for me and then when i was in i want to say 10th or 11th grade maybe 11th grade in high school in cleveland uh i the school that i went to got one of these portable video recorders a black and white reel-to-reel -reel video recorder made by sony it was a box it was about 40 pounds and right the, on, the thing yeah, track, yeah you right. could yeah you could sling it over your shoulder <laughs> yeah. you know with a with a big you know 20 pound camera in your yeah, hand right and, and uh but they let us kids check this thing out like a like a library book right and we could use it for projects so i called a local radio station in cleveland wixie 1260 was the big AM top 40 station, all the kids were listening to back then. And, and I, I just called them up and I said, I, I would like to come down and just look at your radio station and maybe talk to some of the DJs there and stuff, not having any idea whether you could do that or not. And they <laughs> said, sure, come on down. So yeah. I took this thing down and I remember getting off the elevator and seeing the jock on the air behind the you know, wall, uh, ceiling to floor glass and seeing him on the air and hearing the speakers out there in the lobby and just going, Oh, okay. Wow. This is it. Wow. And yeah, yeah, it was, it was mind bending to me. <laughs> and so the jock let me come into the studio and I recorded him on the air and, and, uh, that, that really, uh, was impactful for me. And, um, and then the next year when I was, uh, I guess maybe, uh, again, either a junior or early senior in high school, I, um, I got, I, I called yet another, it must, must've been a, 
a junior, it's like right after that, that I called an FM station in Cleveland and uh, wanted, wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to come down and take a look. And they were very gracious and let me come down and kind of poke around. And I ended, they ended up not hiring me because they weren't paying me any money, but but allowed me to come in late at night and answer the request lines for the DJ who was on the air at night. And just feeling like I was a part of that team was, it was like nothing I'd ever felt before. And I thought, this is what I want to do, I think. So, (laughs) so I went off to college and, uh, Ended up getting my first class radio, uh, not first class, sorry. <laughs> that was You're really coming. ambitious. Third <laughs> class uh, FCC uh, r- r- radio license. And and uh, it, while I was out there in um, Boulder, I was going to school at uh, CU Boulder. And nice. so I went down to Good Denver, choice. got my, I love that got my, like, yes, yeah, great place to be. Yeah. And got my license. And um, in 1974, went, I, I quit school, went home, got married. And uh, about a year later, um, uh, at the beginning of 1975, I actually got my first job in radio. Uh, it was a fluke it was my brother-in-law at the time was working for a station, uh, doing news. And he said, look, I know you want to get into radio and the station I'm working at is going to be changing formats and they're going to be, people are going to quit. <laughs> well, not, not quit. They're just, they're, they're all getting, getting tossed. Right. Yeah, yeah. They're all getting they're swept, going in a different direction. Swept aside. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So they cleaned house and I went down and talked to the new program director. And even though I, I had no experience, it was the kind of radio station that was perfect because it was a beautiful music station where you didn't have to be a personality. Um, they just needed basically button pushers to to run the tapes. You know, and it was all go, formatted. Joy, FM ninety six. Yeah. yeah and come on every we quarter. The same story. Quarter, quarter hour <laughs> doing you know, doing the time attempt and read a PSA and that was it. And so they hired me to do weekends midnight to six. <laughs> and <laughs> graveyard. Yeah, you, you couldn't get more graveyard than that. Yeah. But you were on the But air. I was on the air, and I was hired by <laughs> a radio a station. Shift, like, I, I six, didn't, hours. six hours? That's, that was standard. Well, listen, uh, on that, this is <laughs> – yeah, it was long, and because it was midnight to six, um, for whatever reason, they had a, a, a darkroom timer. Uh, yeah, yeah. At this radio station, it was a big timer, you know, that had the right. knob that you could set it. To. So what I would do is I would look at the next quarter hour of music because it's all pre-recorded, right. you know, this is just the big, you know, 10 inch, mm-hmm. 12 inch reels. And, and I would see how long the next break, how, how long the next segment was. Yeah. And so I would set the timer right. to a minute shy of whatever that length is. If it was 13 and a half minutes, I'd set this to 12 minutes. And then I'd lay down on the floor, <laughs> and I would sleep. And then the timer would go off. I, 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 I wake up. I have a feeling up. that sometimes it didn't go off. Well, maybe there were a couple of times. <laughs> but, or it went off and I didn't. But, uh, yeah, so I would, you know, I'd get effectively uh, you know, about four hours of sleep a night while, while I was at the radio station. Oh, gosh, if, my, if you're out there, buddy, Mark Rao. And I mean, not Mark Rob, but uh, Mark Roth. Uh, he was my PD at the time. I didn't really do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that was, was, that was nice telling a colorful That was 1975. Story. Yeah. That was a long time ago. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I got my start. And then I sort of, you know, bounced around from one station to another. Um, but all in the in the Cleveland market, I I didn't want radio so badly that I was going to go to El Paso and, and, and do an evening shift. You know, uh, if I... If I couldn't just stay in Cleveland, then I would do something else was my mm, attitude. Okay. And uh, I was real interested in theater. I was doing a lot of theater at the time and and um, and uh, modeling. I was doing modeling. and re- I was doing anything that I could think of in the Cleveland market that had anything to do with the entertainment industry. So, so yeah, that's how I got started. And, yeah. and it was in that process at one of the radio stations that I was at. Uh, along around 1978 or so that I discovered voiceover. And then that's where the voiceover thing uh, hit. When I realized, because I was production director at one of the stations I was working at. And of course, as production director, you, you, you know, you have to voice all the spots or most yeah. of the spots right. and produce and, them for the and, station. And, and cast them and go like, get the tra- traffic manager and the sales manager and the station manager. And, and make no extra money for it. Right. Yeah. So I was working at a radio station where they had hired me for middays and and but they had a separate production guy and 
they fired the production guy after I would have been there about a year. They fired the production guy and gave me the job as production director as well as my, my midday shift, Jeez. but didn't give me any more money. Oh, wow. Okay. So, they got well, rid, so they got rid of his <laughs> salary, salary and it gave it all to me. And of course, I sucked it up because I love production. Yeah, and uh, I did then. I I still do now, and uh, and so yeah. So I was doing a lot of production, but when I realized that there were ad agencies in town who wanted to use my voice on a spot, and they'd hire me, and I'd go to a an in you know a, a an independent recording studio right. in Cleveland that wasn't my radio station. I could just walk could, in and walk out. Well, I could walk in and walk <laughs> out, and they actually pay me cash money. And wow, wow, and I can still do my radio job but, but i can do this on the it was like holy cow this what is a revelation this, it was a revelation <laughs> yeah it totally was yeah and uh and so i started pursuing more of that and finally after about maybe four years of doing that i was making more money a year in cleveland doing my freelance voice freelance, stuff absolutely than it was yeah. the radio station and i thought this just makes no sense i'm working six days a week on the air and doing production and uh, it just you know so i went and i asked for a raise after the may sweeps after the may book came out in 1984 and i went in and I, I i had all my numbers highlighted in yellow and everything and i thought they've got to give me a raise and they didn't the mm -hmm. pd just sort of looked at me and says we've got no money for that i said well then you know what and this is not characteristic for me but i had gone in there thinking if they don't give me a raise then i'm giving them my two week notice well, you said and, you had an intention to say, yeah, you knew you were... I, I really did. And, and like I said, typically I don't do that, but I did. I thought, you know what, doggone it. I deserve this. And I, uh, I need this and they didn't give it to me. And so I said, well, then consider this my two week notice. And then all uh, of a sudden he's like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 <laughs> I said, nah, you know what? You showed your colors and it's time to go. So that was it. I worked for two more weeks and then I was off. But the move out here though probably never would have happened if um, about this was right after. So I had just turned 30 in the end of May of 1984. And, and then I just quit my radio career about two weeks after that. And about two weeks after that, I got a call from my landlord saying we've been renting this house for about five years. And he said, uh, I'm going to be selling the house. You guys are going to have to move. Now, I had three little kids at the time, and oh, um, and two of them were already in school. Yeah. And I thought, and he said, well, you got to be out by the end of September of 84. And I, right and in the I middle thought, of school. Well, right, in the, right in the middle of it. Man. Yeah. It's like, you know, heading into summer. And I thought, no, oh, I got to be some settled someplace before that because I got to get my yeah. kids in school. Right. Yeah. So I thought that gives me like two months to figure out what to do. Well, I'd always wanted to move either to New York to pursue acting uh -huh. or move to L.A. to pursue <laughs> acting. Um, not giving much thought to doing voiceover as a career yeah. and certainly not radio. I mean, I, I had had 10 years of radio and it was fine for me, but it wasn't the love of my life. And, and, and I thought acting was so, so that summer, um, I made the decision. I talked to my wife about it and made the decision to move out here. And, uh, I came out right after the Olympics of 84, which would have been toward the end of August, almost the, uh, about the. 20th of August or so around in there looked around for a place to live found a little place over in Glendale to rent and literally two weeks later we were living here wow. I mean I, I flew home we had a, a house sale we sold a car and um, you know called the moving company they packed us up and that's and commitment just, right there we yeah. just up and moved I knew one person out here and she's somebody that I had done some community theater with back in Cleveland and uh, some youth theater and uh and she but she was great she got me a, an interview at her agency which at the time was special artists and uh, jeff danis was uh, the brand new voiceover agent there at that point and uh and then her husband david jolliffe had gotten me uh you know uh, an interview over at sbv um and then i also got an interview over with tisham so wow you're getting shot so down. i so i went and saw these people but the but uh SBV Rita was great, and she said, "You know, I've already got some guys who sound, you know, pretty much like you." Well, it turned out it was Rob Paulson and Cam Clark, ah. <laughs> and whom I didn't know at the time, of right. course. But um, but she, but uh, 
But Jeff Danis over at uh, over at uh, Special Artists said, "Yeah, I'd, I'd love to sign you." And so I did, and I thought, "Well, this is great. I can maybe do a little voiceover work in the in the meantime while I'm trying to get my acting career off the ground." Well, I just I'd never even ended up pursuing seriously the acting thing because the voiceover thing just ended up taking off pretty much right away. So, yeah. Wow. So yeah. that's how all yeah. that started, and that's what got me here. All right. Well, yeah. that's a great story in itself. Uh, if you're just joining us, our guest is Townsend Coleman. You've heard him on everything, and animation. Well, and not exactly everything, but a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things. Are well, you doing Depends commercials yet? I'm not doing Depends okay. commercials. You mean on camera? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got three old guys in glasses here. Yeah, right? really. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. If you've got a question for Townsend, we'd love to have you ask it. Join us in our uh, our chat room on Facebook or on our homepage. And type it in in uh, the chat room. And Jeff Holman is our social media czar tonight. And he will relay that question to us. And we will get to that in our next segment. All right. So you, you've been doing this a long time. Since 1984 here in L.A. I, I assume from all the people I've met and talked to that things have changed a great deal since then. You were able to waltz in here. You know, <laughs> you know and, and get an agent. You know, I'm sure it happened I, over... I, a week or so. No, it was a couple of weeks. I got. I just got really lucky. Yeah, you know, sort of right place, right time. Sort yeah. Of thing. Well, and that's the thing. When you get that kind of an opportunity, you got to deliver. And yeah. Clearly, you were able to do that. So luck favors the prepared. Exactly. And yeah. uh, so you're, you're you're doing. So what were some of the things you were doing when you first started here? Well, when I first started, um, like I said, I got really lucky. About six months after I moved here, I. With, within a 10-day span of, in March of 85, I ended up getting my first on-camera uh, national network TV spot for crap barbecue sauce. Uh, I got my first little part in a movie, uh, ended up being my only part in a movie <laughs> ever. Uh, <laughs> but with the, well, it was a scene with Tommy Lee Jones in a, in a picture, which was kind of a trip back then. And, uh, and my first cartoon series. Uh, which was Inspector Gadget. And oh. that's the thing that really turned things around for me back then because I I had given no thought at all to doing cartoons, even though at some of the stations that I worked at back in Cleveland, I'd done some character work and stuff, but mm. um, and had done a lot of theater, but just never, I don't know, cartoons weren't really on my radar. I came out here really to be a, an on-camera actor, which w w was sort of my, my goal and my dream. Um, but I, I went on this audition for Inspector Gadget. They were adding a little character to the last 10 episodes of the series. And 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 I, and I went into this audition um, really with abandon. I, I just, I, I didn't know a thing about it. I thought, how hard can it be? But the real, <laughs> but the real case, and, and I, 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 admittedly, that was very naive. But, but back then, uh, I had gone on two callbacks already for this craft barbecue sauce on camera commercial. And after my second callback and I'm dressed in this, this get up with a sweater vest and a bow tie and these big glasses, I was supposed to be a sort of a, a Jimmy Olsen kind of character oh, yeah. playing a photographer in this spot. And right. so I went dressed up as this sort of character and the callback went really, really well. And as an actor, when something hits, you just know it. You just feel it. You sense it. And it's like, you just know. And so at that moment, I knew that I had nailed that, that, that spot. And it was just a matter of waiting to hear from my agent, you know, that I'd gotten the booking, but I was so sure of it. And because of that, when I left the audition, I was just, I was just higher than a kite. I mean, I was walking on air <laughs> and, and I had to go straight from that callback to this audition for Inspector Gadget. And I'm meeting with Mar Marsha Goodman over at Deke. And she invited me in. We went into her office. She had a little Radio Shack cassette recorder on her desk and a little Radio Shack mic. I mean... <laughs> That's what my grandmother record interviews with me with when I was three. Right. That's what was on the desk. And, and you got the part, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. My grandmother <laughs> kept me. So, so, I, so I did this audition for Inspector Gadget. And... Um, and we just had fun. Marsha and I were, you know, 15, 20 minutes just messing around with this character. And and I felt really good about that. But it was really the, the on-camera spot for craft that I was that I was excited about. And about two week, about two days later, uh, 
on the same day, I got the call that I had booked the craft uh, barbecue sauce spot and Inspector Gadget. And so I had my first booking for this cartoon. And I'll tell you, you uh, what a l- kind of a life changer that was because I found myself in a little studio over in Burbank. It was a B&B Sound. Hmm. And and there's just four of us in the studio. There's Maurice LaMarche, hmm. and it was Moe's first uh, series also. Wow. <laughs> and there's Frank Welker sitting right next to me on this right. side. And I, Maybe you've heard of that guy. I, I, well, I hadn't heard of him. No. So I didn't know him. who he was. Yeah. And, you know. Don Adams. And, and me. And then Don Adams is sitting right here. And I'm just like, how? <laughs> six months ago, I was living in Cleveland. How in the yeah. world did this happen? But. It did, and I made the most of it. But, but uh, yeah. So that was the day that I not only got my, you know, a sort of a face full of what animation was all about, but what talent like Maurice and Frank were all about. I, I, they just blew my minds in that session. And I'll never forget because it was at that session that because my kids had watched the show back in Cleveland, I knew that there was this character, Doctor Claw, on this show that had. Just, just, you know, yeah. an enormous voice. And I always thought whenever I'd hear that voice in the background when I was back home, that the, the guy, I was trying to picture what the guy must have looked like because <laughs> I didn't know who it was. And I thought this guy yeah. must be like nine feet tall, 800 yeah. pounds, you know. Yeah. just. And so when I'm actually sitting there in the studio and I'm looking at Maurice and I'm looking at Frank and I'm looking at Don Adams, who are these and I'm thinking, this voice? well, none of these guys of these could guys. be the guy who does that voice. So they must be, they must do him separately some yeah, other yeah. time, maybe because they can't fit us all in the studio at <laughs> once because the guy's so big. So we're marking our scripts. I'm watching how they're doing this because I'd never yeah. done it before. And we get to some line and I see that there's some Dr. Claw lines coming up. So I figure, well, we'll skip over those and they'll probably do that guy later. So we go into our first record of the first pass of the script and we get to that page that's got the lines uh, for Dr. Claw, and I figure we're just about to skip over it when all of a sudden Frank, sitting right next to me, opens his mouth and out of his face falls this <laughs> incredible voice. And I was so stunned, I was so shocked at that moment that I kind of forgot where I was and, and you had, I guessed. had headphones on, right? What's that? You probably had headphones on, maybe I'm guessing? Uh, so like you're no, hearing no. his voice in your ears? Uh, 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 no, he was just sitting right next just to me. I just hear him. Yeah. him. <laughs> and I was so stunned, I guessed. And I went, oh, my God, <laughs> that's you. And then I realized, Uh-oh. wait a second, we're recording. <laughs> and, and I felt like such an idiot, but I was so blown away that this guy yeah. here next to me was, ah, it was too much. I remember that voice. Yeah. I haven't heard it in 30 years, but I remember it. I'll get you next time, yeah. Gadget. Yes. Next time. Yeah, yeah it's, a, uh, it's just amazing. And and so that was my intro into and animation and i said to my agents i said please you guys it's stuck send, huh? so yeah send me out on more of these kinds of auditions because because right. this stuff is fun and i'd never considered it before but yeah that's great yeah. and you've had a great career which you're still doing uh you were michelangelo on michelangelo on, on, uh, uh, newton uh, it, newton it, ninja turtles teenage, teenage, teenage ninja 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 Tur- Tur- not just any mutant ninja turtles teenage. adolescent adolescent you're right <laughs> Uh, yeah, now it's senior, senioritis, <laughs> mutant Ninja Turtles. But yeah, Ninja Turtles uh, did the tick. I, I was um, I was Scott on Teen Wolf. Uh, did uh, I was Gobo on Fraggle Rock. Um, uh, I was the voice of Waldo on Where's Waldo. <laughs> um, uh, Sentinel Prime on Transformers Animated. I was on the original animated, I mean, the original Transformers. Uh, Wait, was, was Fraggle Rock puppetry? I can't remember. The, the original one was, yeah, on, uh, it was The Muppets. Oh, it was uh, The Muppets. I don't thing. want, it's not The Muppets, but it was by yeah. Jim Henson. But then they did and a, they were all live an action animated series. Right? Um, yeah. The animated series. But like yeah, NBC they... did the animated version gotcha. of it. And so I was on that. Rob Paulson mm-hmm. was on that. And, what? Yeah, all these, Bob, these Bob great names and great talents and stuff. But I, I, I guess the, the, a question that our audience would, would ask, and maybe some of them will, but I'll ask it first. People think that just doing, it's all about doing funny voices and that's not it at all. Tell us what it's really all about when you're, when you're doing that type of work. Yeah. It's really all about acting. Uh, You know, I mean, you can, you can have funny voices, but if it's, but if it's, but if you can't, if that funny voice can't translate into a, 
into a fully fleshed out character that that you can maintain through the course of a script uh, yeah. a show you know the the funny voice is kind of worthless you right. know and conversely you can be a good actor too without the ability to be able to stretch and and sort of see and think outside the box in terms of you know what this instrument that we we all have is capable mm. of doing right. you know it's one of the things that i I really enjoy when I when I, I don't teach often, but when I do teach, um, it's one of the things I really enjoy seeing um, happen with actors when they kind of don't realize what they're capable of doing, but you give them just a few little tricks uh, about you know how to access you know more of the range in their voice or more of the depth or more wh whatever it is. Um, they start putting some of those pieces together and. And seeing their eyes light up and seeing them come alive with, with realizing, holy cow, I can, I, wait, that came out of me? That's weird. I could, <laughs> I could do that. So, it, yeah, it, I mean, it's really about acting, um, but it's about, it's, it's about imagination. It's about being able to, um, I think, it's about not holding yourself back, but it, being able to open up and, and just, tr just try stuff, you know, and, yeah, absolutely. and experiment. So Great. Well, once again, our guest is Townsend Coleman. We're talking about animation and his career and all the fun stuff that goes on in the studios here in Hollywood. If you've got a question for him, throw it in the chat room right now. We'll try to get to it in our next segment here on VoiceOver Body Shop. So don't go away. We'll be right back. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on the VoiceOver Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. So, Levelator. It did a great job of RMS normalization for audiobook content and podcast episodes. But it's orphaned software, which means no one's developing it anymore. And now it doesn't work with the latest Macs and Catalina Mac OS. So you're stuck, right? Well, not anymore. Behold the gooey goodness of Audio Cupcake. Visit audiocupcake.com and download the free Audio Cupcake app for Macintosh. Audio Cupcake does exactly what Levelator did so well for so long. It applies RMS normalization to your audio, and it preps your work for ACX. And it does it so well with Mac OS, including Catalina. Just like with Levelator, you drag and drop your audio file onto the Audio Cupcake window and out pops an RMS normalized file. But Audio Cupcake goes even further. Unlock the premium features of Audio Cupcake. And what pops out? Audio that is both RMS and peak normalized and converted to a 192K mono MP3 file ready for uploading to ACX or your podcast platform. That's delicious audio goodness. Audio Cupcake is available free at audiocupcake.com. That's audiocupcake.com. Audio Cupcake, a beautiful, simple way to master your audio narration and podcasts. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. 
we believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. And we're back. We're back. <laughs> we're back, hey, everybody. Yeah, here we are right show. here with Dad and George oh, and Thompson. It's Thompson. That's not Thompson. your name. It's the morning show. All it's right. the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we're just talking about <laughs> bad DJs in the days of pukers. Oh, we had to do it. It still goes on though. Well, it does still go on, yeah. You know, but not just not here. Maybe not you in just, LA. you just, yeah, you, you just, you just. The prerequisite for getting hired like that is you can't, you, you can't have the ability to say M's or N's. <laughs> you gotta have like bad ad noise like that. Right. And I'll just, you just become a puker, like because that's what everybody wants to hear. <laughs> now, one of the other areas you drifted into, or maybe you didn't drift, maybe you like took a direct route right there. Oh, I did. It was so, intentional. I went right for it. <laughs> Promo work. Pro oh, <laughs> yeah, no, that, you, you, yeah, you talk about being a, a dog leg there. I mean, that, uh, um, if I had never given any thought to doing animation yeah. i really had given no thought to doing promos because not that i wouldn't have wanted to and i, and I had done just a, a a few here and there kind of specialty promos before this but as far as being the voice of a network or something like that i never gave that any thought because those guys were that you know that was done and and uh Chuck it seemed like Riley. hallowed ground or something. What's that? It seemed like hallowed ground. Oh, not Maybe only hallowed, and it was. hallowed ground, but yeah. I mean, these <clears throat> these guys were like the big voice guys in in the business, and uh, that was not me. You know, I, yeah. I didn't I didn't have a voice like that. It's, I still don't. <laughs> and um, and so I I never gave really any thought to it. But uh, uh, again, one of these like just stupid lucky <laughs> lucky breaks. I happen to be standing in Jeff's office, in my agent's office at one point, when by this time now it's at ICM. And um, and, and we're just chatting, chatting, it was in the afternoon. He gets a phone call from a guy over at NBC looking for a, a certain kind of voice. And I hear Jeff's end of the conversation, and he's saying, no, 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 it, it, no, they, they, they won't do that, da, 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 da. But I happen to have a guy standing here who does very much what you're talking about. And I'm like, what? what? Yeah, and this? so, so <laughs> Jeff hands me, yeah. hands me the phone you're on, and man. he says, just do your, I'm like, oh, okay. So I get on the phone with guy and he says, yeah. So he, Jeff tells me you didn't. And I said, yeah. And he says, well, could you just try saying this? And so I did in that style, which was a, a popular style at the time. And he said, uh, he said, wow, that's great. Could you come over here and try it on a promo here at, NBC. And I said, sure. When? And he said, well, like this afternoon. And I said, I'll be right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I literally left ICM and uh, a couple hours later went over to NBC. They had a drive on for me. I went down uh, and this was in August of 1993. And, and uh, I was a big fan of Danny Darks. Huge fan. I mean, Danny was one of my all-time idols. In fact, I remember meeting him shortly after I, I came to town in '84. Probably in in '85 or '86, sometime I had gotten a gig doing some Keebler Elves, and Danny was the voice of Keebler. He was the the announcer on Keebler, and and I remember when I got this, I was more excited about the potential of meeting Danny Dark than I was about doing a Keebler Elf. Right. You know, and. Sure enough, at the end of the session, Danny showed up to do his, you know, little one-liner tag at the very end. And I introduced myself to him, told him I was a big fan, and he was very gracious and just a really cool guy. So now cut to August of 93, and I go down to the basement at NBC in Burbank, and it's in a studio they had uh, at the time called uh, PPS2. And I went into this studio, and they led me over to where the mic was, and I was a little taken aback because... I was so used to working 
when I did VO, first of all, I always stood up. I never sat down. And I was always in a studio, um, you know, with a control room. No. Oh. Well, here they in that they had the announcer sitting in the same room with the room producer, the audio mixer, the CMX operator, um, and then another producer, all in this room. So there was no booth, and I had to sit down. So I was a little kind of weirded out about that at first. What network was this? NBC. It was NBC. NBC yeah, okay, interesting. Down, down in the basement. Yeah. So, yeah. so I sit down. I'm sitting there at the U87. And, and I look at the mic and well, first of all, I look at a chair, <laughs> this is so goofy, but I, I look at the chair and I think, oh my God, that's Danny Dark's chair. And, and then I look at the mic and I sit down and I'm like, this is Danny Dark's mic. And then I'm putting the headphones, these are Danny Dark's headphones and this is Danny Dark's volume control. <laughs> like everything yeah. was yeah. Danny Dark's everything. Yeah. Danny Dark's monitor in front of me. And, yeah. and I couldn't get him out of my head, but they were starting this campaign called Must See TV. And so they were looking for something that was not very promo-y, if you will. Um, and it, I mean, here all these years, 25 years later, we're still hearing this, not an ounceery, conversational, uh, which is what they were looking for back then. Mm -hmm. And so, so we played around with the spot uh, for about 20 minutes and they liked what they got from it and they ended up putting it on the air that night. And oh, I was, wow. yeah, I was, I was shocked. And so that almost like introduced this new voice to promo that campaign. Well, yeah, yeah. But I, I wasn't thinking that I was just thinking, holy cow, I just did an NBC promo. This is crazy. Yeah. You know? And of course I'm thinking of my parents, they met working at NBC at 30 mm -hmm. rock. Um, and this was my dad's goal was to be a voice on this network. So that was pretty cool for me. And but, but what made it even cooler was, and that was on a Friday. The next day, I get a call from my agent, NBC wants you back today. I'm like, wow, on a Saturday? So I went in, did some mm. more spot. Same thing on Sunday. Same thing on Monday. For like almost a week straight, Whoa. they were having me in almost every day because they were doing a big push on this must-see TV campaign. I see. So, so all of a sudden, they're using me a ton. And within like two months... Um, all of a sudden, now I'm the voice of their Tuesday night block, and I'm I'm doing this must see TV stuff, and they give me a few things that are for Thursday's block too, and and I'm like, wow, this is I got to do a Seinfeld spot, you know, it was like such a rush for me. After about three months, I get a call over Halloween weekend from a guy there on a Friday night. It's seven o'clock at night. I'm standing in my kitchen. Hello, hi, this is Todd Crook over at NBC. Um, just want to let you know that. They'd really like to use you for the Tonight Show promos. Oh, cool. So we're wondering if you can, if you're interested, could you be here by 7 o'clock on Monday? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I guess. So I show up at 7 o'clock on Monday, and, uh, and we do the first of what they call hot topicals for Jay. Because what had been happening was they were just running like 10-second generic spots. I and see. Jay was getting his butt kicked by Letterman at the mm -hmm. time. And so they wanted to do these topicals where they actually recorded bits, took bits from the show that they had just recorded, built a 20-second promo around that, and then got it on the satellite back to the East Coast by 10.30. So 7.30 our time. So we got like a half an hour to get this thing cranked out on the room. satellite back yeah. to New York by 10.30 because they wanted it on the air in that last half hour of prime time. And so it was only a five week gig because they wanted it for the November sweeps of, of 93. Well, at the end of that five week, I had such a blast doing that. And at the end of that five weeks, they just never told us to stop. <laughs> so I said, it. well, so what do we do Monday? Do we like show up again? I said, well, yeah, why don't you show up and we'll take it from there. So I showed up the following Monday after that five weeks and it kept going for 16 years. 16 more months, 16, 16 more years. 16 more years, yeah. So that'll pay the mortgage. Yeah. Wow. So that's how the NBC <laughs> thing came came about for me. And I it was just uh gosh, I mean, what a what a blast and what an honor to have been even just given that shot, you know, to really? to have fun with it. And it took me about probably three or four months, I, I gotta say, uh, to get Danny's voice out of my head. 
because he was he had such a signature yeah. sound and yeah. the way he said nbc and the way he sold comedy yeah. and the way he just did what he did was that's all i could hear in my head yeah and especially when i said nbc and it it took wow. me a long time and wow. it felt like a long yeah. time to we got some questions from our audience so let's hear them all right uh, from Tricia Rose, who says, "Oh, Tricia, yeah, I'm you... so excited to see Townsend Coleman as the featured guest on this episode. I'm particularly interested in his audio drama theater work as Jason Whitaker in The Adventures in Odyssey or anything else. How does he view audio drama as similar or different from other genres of voiceover work? Well, uh, you know, it's it all acting. again gets back to acting. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so in that sense, it doesn't really." um differ that much uh trisha um you know i love my my the work that i get to do on adventures and odyssey uh long running radio drama um they just celebrated so they've been going what about uh, 33 years now i've been on the show since 1994 so at this point it's the longest running gig that i have and i'm still doing it so i'm very thankful for it um but it's acting and uh what 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 facilitates the acting in a show like this is great writing, um, great writing and great production is what makes a show like that work, I think. Yeah. And, and, and so they've just been a, a great bunch of folks to work with uh, out, out of Colorado Springs. They come into town, we record the shows here, and then they go back to Focus's headquarters and uh, actually produce the show back there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jess, yeah. do you need a demo to do that kind of stuff to break into that, or because it's you know, probably Dan, an expanding genre with podcasting and stuff like that? Yeah, uh, radio drama, audio drama. Um, uh, there's there's so many genres now within voiceover that you can really sort of kind of sort of pick pick your weapon, if you will, and and hone in on that, zero in on that uh, as much as you can. Um, demos, I think, are are going to be um, critical uh, in pretty much any area of voiceover, I think. Still, um, when I came out here from Cleveland, uh, one of the things I came out with was a really strong demo because I had, A, I was a production director, so I knew, you know, sort of what to listen for. Right. And I had been doing at that point uh, VO for about five years. And, and I, and also in that job, I was responsible for taking all these quarter inch tapes that were sent to us from Chicago right. and L.A. and New York that had all the big national announcers on. them. You know, yeah. so when I would get a tape in that had Danny Dark on it, you know, for Chevy or for um, for Anheuser-Busch. Uh, oh, my gosh. I would listen to these voices and I want to find out who they were. So I really did a lot of homework when I was producing spots and when I was production director in Cleveland. And, and so I knew I came out with a really strong demo. Well, that ended up being a, um, probably the best tool I could have come out here with because uh, it, it really is in many ways kind of what, la what launched me into the career that I've had. Yeah. Demos are still important. Um, you know, they need to be specific. You don't want a demo that's going to, you know, show a little of this, a little animation, a little commercial, a little promo, a little audio book, a little... You, you don't want you don't want something like that. You want right. them to be specific. You want them to be short. You want to get right to the, just like in radio. You know when you send out an air check to to another radio station to try and get a a, a job at another station, the PD will listen because they listen to these things all day. You know he'll listen to the first you know five ten seconds and know instantly whether this is somebody they want to even continue listening to or not. Right. Yeah, and so. So yeah, demos um, demos are are, are critical. Um, not, and I suppose it depends on the area of the business you're in. But I want to say demos are almost more important for getting agents, mm. getting an agent, than they are for getting the actual work. Right. Now I think yeah. they are important for getting the actual work too. Right. But yeah. casting but, directors aren't generally listening to the demos. They're like, "What have you done lately?" And, and well, they're the they're listening out. to the audition that your agent right. has just sent you. Exactly. You know, and you've MP3 back, and hopefully, you right. know your your MP3 doesn't <laughs> disappear out into the ether right. like so often feels like the case. Right, George, we got a question from Portugal. What? <laughs> Appears not, to be true from yeah. Jose Lucio Duarte. Uh, please ask Townsend how he uh, how he records when away from his studio, and if we if you use plugins for mouth noise, things like that. 
he's more into the tech stuff of this. Uh, um, if I record, I record documentaries without looking at the image. Oh, how, if how you, you record documentaries, documentaries without, without looking, looking the at the images. Uh, thanks. Ah. Cheers from Portugal. So first, how do you, what's your remote rig? What do you do when you leave your home? Studio? All right. Well, there are a couple of questions in there. Um, uh, first of all, my remote rig is, um, uh, in, in it is becoming increasingly smaller as the years go by. Yeah. Um, I just use MacBook Pro. Um, I was using a Shure X2U to get my, I've got a, four, well, you guys can't see this, but there's a 416 plugged in here so that we can all hear the lovely Dan Leonard here. Um, uh, but so I use a 416. Uh, I was using a Shure X2U, but I'm now using the um, the Centrance MicPort Pro 2. Yeah. Um, which is a really cool little uh, little device for yeah. a number of reasons. Um, but I, sh I still love the Shure X2U. I, trust me, I do not go out of my way to have any expensive, fancy box that I lug along with me. Because frankly, I, I don't think it's worth it. I don't think people can hear the difference, you, you know, or at least most people can't. The people that, that matter can't hear the difference. So <laughs> that's why I don't bother, you know, with anything high end like that. Um, and uh, and just a pair of earbuds that you plug right into the side of the Shure X2U or in this in my case into the MyPort Pro 2. Um, so that's it. I don't use plugins. I just record straight into Twisted Wave, and uh, do my editing in Twisted Wave and send the MP3 to my my agent. But if I'm doing an actual session, so those would be auditions, and I typically don't do auditions from the road. Um, I take my rig with me in case I have to work, and I am very blessed and fortunate to still have a job that is a daily gig. I voice the the promos, the daily promos for Live with Kelly and Ryan. And mm -hmm. so if I go to visit my daughter in the Bay Area or my son in Denver or my other daughter in Phoenix, um, I always take my rig with me. Um, because I do I I work every day from home and I do my promos from home but it's it's live in the sense that they're feeding me the track from studio city here in town um and i'm hearing the track and announcing to it and they're recording my voice on their end so so it's super convenient super efficient um uh, it's just super <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so but i still have to do the same thing when i go on the road so so what i um i use ipdtl to connect um, used to have to bridge through Source Connect and uh, the, a, a guy who had a remote um, studio where he just bridged the ISDN plug with them together. Yeah, I mean, just like <laughs> plug, plug them together. Uh, international symbol for yeah, the plugging it cable. Could be a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't mean it like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I use IPDTL to do my sessions when I'm on the road, but it's. It is as stripped down as they get. And it's getting to the point now where um, I probably, uh, it's getting very close now to the point where I won't even need to take my laptop with me. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just do it from my phone. Um, yeah. It's oh, getting there. Cool. So, yeah. And you do a and pillow the, fort? What's that? You I do don't. Pillow fort? No, you know what? I see these, I see these posts of guys, you know, building their pillow forts and all this crazy stuff. I never do that. However, understand that the reason that I don't is there, there's a couple of reasons. A, I'm a really loud announcer. So, it's, so there's a lot of volume coming out of my mouth when I announce because these are promos and they're, they're up exciting promos. And I'm having to fight with a lot of crowd noise, uh, music, uh, sound effects. I mean, all kinds of stuff going on. So, so I'm loud anyway. I'm on a 416, which is highly directional. I work at like three inches from the end of the, the mic. But the gain um, pretty low. Yeah, it, it gains pretty low, you know, so I don't crush it. And, and so it almost doesn't matter what room I'm in if I'm in a hotel room, you know, unless there's like a lot of banging and stuff going on. Um, I just, I don't need the pillow forts and stuff. Now, if I were doing an audio book and I had a large diaphragm condenser, well, sure. Then, of course. But a, I'm not ever carrying ever carrying a large diaphragm condenser on the road with me, and and b, I, I don't do audiobooks. <laughs> so you know, unless it's unless it's something that's real nice and quiet and easy going that I really need super quiet, I don't worry about pillow forts. I don't worry about plugins. I don't. You probably don't have to worry about RX7 mouthy clicking either. 
because you're doing you're projecting so much. Right. So Listen, I'll, really... I'll, 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 I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was at the NAB show uh, with Kevin uh, and the gang from IPDTL. And I was working in their booth and, but I still had, it was during the week and I still had to do my session. So I did my session from their booth on the floor. In fact, I think you were there that from year. From a booth. Been, I mean, we say booth, it, we don't mean a voiceover booth. No. We I, mean like a trade a, show a trade expo show hall. Yeah. Right. And he's sitting at a, like a desk. A, a desk. In a, a table. Huge, in a huge room. hall. With, yeah. yeah. In the middle, in the middle of this uh, uh, expo huge booth. Room. Yeah. And was doing my sessions with all the ambience of the, the convention, you know, show and, and people talking that. in groups behind me and stuff. I was still doing my sessions, oh my boom, like that with Studio City, you know, live to them back here in L.A. And <laughs> not a problem at all. And, and what little background noise there was, the engineer on this end, he just put it through RX and... Let him clean it up. Yeah, let him clean it up. <laughs> yeah, got rid of the background noise and stuff, and they still put yeah. it on the air, and it's on fine. You yeah. know, so, so I, I think we sometimes worry too much about all this, you know, high end. You know, gotta be the best. You gotta, know, be, gotta be Avalon. Gotta be whatever. Right. Um, there are just a couple of things in your quiver that really, that really are critical. For me, it's the four sixteen starts right there, and then, and then beyond that, you know the interface is like kind of whatever you're comfortable with you know and whatever travels well we're going to test a whole bunch of interfaces one of these days against oh, cool. each other and we're going, to, we're going to really try to listen cool do they make a difference hundred dollars yeah. five hundred dollars well i'll tell you, know, you the, the sure x2 u is a 99 dollar little cigar anything. shape yeah. you know yeah. thing that is just it's brilliant Shockingly and it works good. so well yeah and um the, but what i like about the the centrance mic port pro 2 now is um, you can you can uh, plug it into a lightning connector, mm -hmm. right? So I can plug it into my iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. yeah. So all of a sudden now I've got a way Do to get my four sixteen into my iPhone really conveniently, yep. and I don't have to worry about my iPhone powering the forty eight volt uh, phantom right. power on it because it's got a built in rechargeable battery right. that lasts forever, and it's got a great mic pre in it, um, and it's got a little limiter. It's got a little limiter built into it yep, too. I right. So I mean, this thing—I right. I just think it's brilliant. Yeah, so it really much is. for our Harlan Hogan commercial for tonight. Uh, <laughs> Harlan, I'm so sorry, man. No, no, you just. I, so I see we got, great. we got. I see we got a Harlan Hogan mic here. Yeah, that's right. We did Townsend, it. it has been great having you with us tonight. Say, are, These are great are, stories. Are you playing me off? No, you Am can I, stay here for. You can stay all, the whole night if you want. <laughs> but we, uh, we we got to go for for this segment anyway. Okay. Good. Now we got to do some tech talk. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for being here. This, these oh, are great stories. Like pleasure. Things that pleasure. people like me can totally relate to because you and I have the exact same story. Only you came out to LA in 84 and I went home. So anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for being here. Thank you. All Thank right. You. George and I will be right back to wrap things up right after this. This is Anthony Mendez and you're watching Voice Over Body Show. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Well, it's that time of the show where we get to talk about one of our longtime sponsors here at the show. That's Source Elements, and they're the creators of Source Connect, Source Connect Now, and quite a lot of different tools on that website. In fact, if you want to see, I can't even possibly cover everything they make here in this one spot, but if you go over to source-elements.com, take a look over there and see what kinds of services they provide because they're adding new features all the time. But for you guys in voiceover, the one tool that most of you probably want to explore getting 
because you want to start doing bigger gigs. You have an agent now and you're starting to do larger budget projects where they're recording you from another studio. You probably want to explore getting Source Connect. There's a two versions, Source Connect Standard and Source Connect Pro. The one you want to check out is Source Connect Standard. And you can get a free 15-day trial right over at the website. It uses this thing called an iLock for licensing. Don't have to buy the little USB dongle. It works right on your Windows or Mac computer. And get yourself acquainted with Source Connect and learn how to use it. Because chances are at some point, one of your clients or one of your agents is going to say, you got to have it to get this gig. Or I'm not going to hire you or you're not going to be on my agent's roster unless you have it. So get it up and going. Get used to how it works. And tell them we sent you. We really appreciate it. We'll be right back here to wrap up the show right after this. VoiceOver Essentials only has five of the mixer face without the SD card version. The SD version kind of baffles me for VO anyway, being worth an additional hundred bucks. Backup, I guess. But I always want to record to some device where I can edit. Anyway, the no recording version is on sale now at VoiceOver Essentials. And they only have five left. The regular price, $349.94. Sale price, $329.94. Free shipping in the continental U.S. Mixerface R4 integrates your iPhone, iPad, or Android device into the audio production workflow, making mobile recording easy for broadcasters, musicians, and VO artists on the go. Combined with a long-lasting rechargeable battery, two Nutrick combo jacks, headphone monitor, and 24-bit 192 kilohertz converters, you get an unbeatable mobile production tool right in your pocket. Get it now over at voiceoveressentials.com and tell them we sent you. Thanks, Arlen. Ooh, I think I heard the voice of a body shop. I did. I did hear the voice of a body shop. Wow, great stuff from Townsend Coleman. It was. Those are stories that I love because that was my story. You feel it feels familiar. Well, the production director stuff, all the things that he was talking yeah. about, I, I did all those things, and it was just great fun. Uh, let's see. Next week on this show, we're going to, and we'll get to it in a little bit, is Tech Talk number 28. Mm-hmm. As we go into 2020, and I mean, this is rolling along. People just love that sort of stuff. We've got lots of cool stuff to talk about. Uh, and then on March 16th, we're actually have to skip a week because I'm in a play and I gotta can't do it on a Monday night. So yeah. we'll, we'll miss one week. Uh, Simon Vance. It's for the right will, reasons, though. Right. Well, absolutely. You're acting. Acting! <laughs> That's right. Uh, Simon Vance will be joining us from his new studio. Oh, fantastic. And uh, we haven't talked to Simon in a long time, so that's mm-hmm. going to be a lot of fun. Uh, who are our donors of the week? Oh, they're right here in green. I can't miss are. it. Uh, Matashka Morshuka, who she's been on the show. Oh, yes. Christy Burns, Rob Ryder. Raider. And that should be Raider, which is written in parentheses. <laughs> by the way, this is his studio phonetics. behind us. And we're in Rob Raider's yeah. studio right now. Very nice. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Graham Spicer, Uncle Roy Yokelson at Antland Productions, Michelle Blanker, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Shelley Avellino. George Whittem Sr. Thanks, Dad. And Patty Gibbons. And lastly, Mike Gordon. Mike Quite Gordon. a nice list of names there. That's great. A lot of familiar ones, yeah. too. All you have to do is on our website, go to the Donate Now button and, and help us out to keep this error-free. Well, maybe not error-free, but at least technologically magnificent. Looking great and <laughs> colorful and all the cool things that go and on. And things are moving. That's right. Not like a slideshow. It's pretty cool. That, that, we like that. Uh, join our mailing list uh, so you can find out what's going on in the show. Easy to do. How do they do that? Well, they can sign up by uh, going right over to VOBS.TV, and there's a subscription button on the page. We're not going to spam there. you, but we'll yeah. let you know what's going on in the show, who's coming up, and and that kind of stuff. Right. And if you'd like to be in our studio, join us. Uh, write to us at the guys at VOBS.TV. Tell us when you're in town or you're in the neighborhood or something like that. It's way fun when you guys are here live with us. It just changes the whole, changes the energy. It's a lot of, it's a lot more fun. Absolutely. And there's the studio right there. The studio camera is working. You could be sitting right there between Townsend and Jeff. Right. Yo. And send us your booths. We want to see your booths. Uh, this is Rob Raider's studio here. And send it to us in landscape, not portrait. Landscape. Yeah. 
I know that's the thing to do in Instagram. It's Everybody's not TikTok, like, everybody. Yeah, don't go through. This is this is television. This is sixteen by nine widescreen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, we need to thank our sponsors because without them, we wouldn't have sponsors. Uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. Voice Actor Websites. And JMC Demos. That's James Michael Collins. Right, but it's JMC, J. Michael Collins. JMC Demos. He's that's changed the, the branding. The, he is, that is the branding. He's gone KFC on us. He is. Okay. That's right. JMC Demos. Yes. We also need to thank the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the betterment of live and recorded uh, webcasting and podcasting. Uh, our amazing technical director, Sue Merlino, who just gets it done every week. Say hi, Sue, because I hooked up your mic. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> we have not taught her anything about mic technique. Oh, what is it? You know, below, it? back, no, no. <laughs> hey, yeah, there you go. That works just great. <laughs> and Jeff Holman, who was our social media czar tonight, helping Thanks, us get Jeff. the questions on there. All right, well, we got Tech Talk to do in just a couple of minutes, so stay tuned for that. And if you've got a question, send it in our chat room. Anyway, that's going to do it for us tonight with this section. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Show. Or VO. BS. Yes. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>